Chapter 38 is looking at all the changes that are occurring in the 1960s, from 1960 to 1968. Now to start with, the JFK presidency is often referred to as the Camelot years, this very idealistic image of John F. Kennedy and his administration. Camelot is an allusion to uh, the Camelot in King Arthur's court. Um, so he promoted this image of youth. He's young, he's got a young, beautiful wife and children, um, and also he's promoting this idea of active citizenry in the United States. Uh, famously, he said in, an, in his inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Uh, he is probably one of the more idolized presidents that we've had. Whether he deserves it or not is another story. Um, his domestic policy is known as the new frontier, promoting all these social changes in our country. Um, specifically, creating the Peace Corps is one op uh, thing that he did where people go overseas to help uh, the third world countries. Promoting national defense, and we'll talk more about that, the space program once again, uh, and tax cuts to the middle and lower classes in order to jump start the economy. Other areas of the new uh, frontier are focusing on medical care for the elderly, education, civil rights legislation, etc. The problem is that JFK doesn't get a lot of this stuff passed while he's president uh, because he has to get it past a Congress that was not willing um, to push a lot of this through. We will see a lot of the legislation that he proposed actually passed under his successor, Lyndon Johnson. We'll talk about that later. He also made a claim that by the end of the decade, we would put a man on the moon. And obviously that did happen in 1969. But what this is going to mean is spending millions upon millions upon millions of dollars on a space program in order to achieve that goal. Um, coming into the presidency, JFK inherits, obviously, that Cold War. It's still going on, uh, especially in Eastern Germany. Remember, East Germany and West Germany are two separate countries. East Berlin and West Berlin are two separate cities, even though West Berlin is right smack dab in the Soviet zone. Um, by 1961, about 20% of the East German population had been escaping to West Berlin, literally saying, why are we going to live in this uh, country? Let's go move to West Berlin, walk across the street. And so the leader of the Soviet Union, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, threatened to cut Berlin off once again. He's trying that old scheme that we saw right after World War II was over, if Berlin wasn't given to them. He's focusing on how to keep his population from leaving. Um, basically, Kennedy said absolutely not. He's not going to be the president that allows Berlin to, quote, fall to communism. And so instead of making this a major issue, in August of 1961, East Germany, along with the Soviet Union, began building the Berlin Wall surrounding West Berlin. Now, there is a common misconception here. They are not being walled in. What is being created here is a wall to keep the East Germans out. They cannot escape their country by fleeing to West Berlin. If you lived in West Berlin, you were allowed to leave if you had a passport. This is to keep the East Germans in. And from a military standpoint, JFK is focusing on a policy called flexible response. Um, his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, really said that this, our idea of massive retaliation, our idea of brinkmanship, is impossible to maintain. That the only solution through massive retaliation is going to be nuclear annihilation. We need more options than that. We need to build up our regular military forces. We need to focus on the green, creating uh, special forces like the Green Berets, so that we have multiple ways to respond to the Soviet Union should they do something to make us mad. Here is the building of the Berlin Wall to keep the East German people in. Now, with flexible response, this means a potential of ratcheting up our involvement in Vietnam because slowly but surely more and more Americans are going to engage in this part of the country. If you remember, the French have already left, and so the United States is trying to prop up a very unpopular South Vietnamese government uh, led by the South Vietnamese dictator Ngo Dinh Diem sending him money, sending him aid, sending him whatever he needs to keep him from falling. Because even though he's a dictator, at least he's not a communist dictator in our eyes. But he was very repressive, um, persecuting Buddhists because he was a Catholic, um, which is not going to go over well in a country full of Buddhist people. Uh, very corrupt, using 
uh, federal or his government's money to fund his own uh, things that he wants to accomplish or put it in his own pocket. Um, and so in response to this, and also in response to the fact that those 1956 elections had been canceled, starting around 1957, a new group is formed, the National Liberation Front, the NL. F or the Viet Cong. They're also known as the VC. They're also known as Charlie. All of those are the same group. These are basically South Vietnamese guerrilla warriors. They are in favor of a communist-backed government. And so these guerrilla warriors are fighting their own country from within, trying to destabilize um, the South Vietnamese government, trying to overthrow No Dinh Diem's government so that Ho Chi Minh can come in and take control. Um, and so the Viet Cong are heavily funded and supplied by North Vietnam, receiving uh, money and supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is uh, a series of trails uh, and supply lines that goes from North Vietnam through Laos, through Cambodia, and into South Vietnam to help them fight a, uh, a guerrilla war against the South Vietnamese. Now, if you don't understand this term guerrilla warfare, this is basically sneak attack. These aren't two armies facing one another. These are um, people that look just like a regular citizen of South Vietnam. You don't know who is a VC and who is a South Vietnamese person. Uh, they do a hit-and-run style tactic. They uh, dug tunnels throughout all of South Vietnam in order to easily escape. Uh, they would set up landmines, whatever they need to destabilize South Vietnam from within. So in 1961, once again, Kennedy is a believer in containment policy. He sees that South Vietnam is um, susceptible to falling, and so he begins sending troops there, um, which he calls advisors at this time, so that there are 16,000 Americans in country, as they call it, by 1963. However, we are still not actually engaged in warfare. We are trying to prop up the South Vietnamese government. Um, but very quickly we realize that No Dinh Diem's government, there's no way we're going to keep it from falling. He is that hated in South Vietnam. And so the United States, through a CIA coup, um, basically overthrows Diem's government to install a more stable, still non-communist government. And he is assassinated also in November of 1963. Uh, this is a picture. I told you No Dinh Diem was a, per he persecuted the Buddhists. Um, this is an example of a protest, a peaceful protest by one of these Buddhist monks. This was a very common sight in South Vietnam. They would walk to the middle of the street, douse themselves in gasoline, and set themselves on fire and sit down and die to protest how horrible No Dinh Diem's government was. So other foreign issues that F or JFK is going to have to deal with, uh, dealing with Cuba. Remember, Cuba has now, quote unquote, fallen to communism. Um, so before Eisenhower even left office in the summer of 1960, Eisenhower and the CIA began training Cuban exiles, remember all those people that had left Cuba when Fidel Castro came to power, uh, to launch a, an invasion into Cuba to try to overthrow Castro's government, thinking they could use these Cuban exiles with some U.S. air support in order to crush Cuba's government. So when Kennedy comes to the presidency, he reluctantly inherits this plan. Um, um, and he promised these, this exile army air support to help them out. But he was never really comfortable with this plan to begin with. So in April of 1961, 14,000 Cuban exiles landed at the Bay of Pigs. This is on the southern coast of Cuba. Uh, air support never came. Um, because Kennedy at the last minute pulled out of that. And as a result, these Cuban exiles were completely crushed by the Cuban army, who was obviously heavily funded and supplied by the USSR. This was a major, major defeat for the Kennedy administration right off the bat because uh, it showed weakness. And also, the Soviet Union and the Cubans are pretty angry at the United States because it's obvious who had been training these Cuban exiles. Um, so this is going to push Cuba even more towards the arms of the Soviet Union in order to protect themselves. Uh, this is going to lead us then to the summer of 1962. In the summer of 1962, our uh, spy planes were gathering information over um, the island of Cuba. And we discovered that the USSR was in the process of setting up ICBM technology, intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba, that would have the capability of launching nuclear missiles against the United States. This is huge because uh, Cuba is literally 90 miles from the coast 
of uh, Florida. This would mean that should they launch an attack on the United States, we wouldn't even know it was coming. It would be way too late. There would be no warning because those missiles would reach the United States in a matter of minutes. Um, so this is a very dire situation. Uh, Kennedy cannot allow this to continue. At least at this point, he felt that the missiles were not fully operational. Uh, and so he went on, on television that uh, year to basically warn the American people that this was going on and to tell Nikita Khrushchev, pull these weapons out or else that he was setting up a naval quarantine, this is essentially a blockade around the island of Cuba, to not allow anything into the island because um, he felt that if the Soviets continued to um, bring in supplies, it was only a matter of time before these missiles were operational. So this is literally the closest we ever came to nuclear war because we are standing nose to nose with the Soviet Union wondering who is going to blink first. You know, if they run through that, uh, that, that quarantine line, that would have been considered an act of war. Uh, and who knows what could have happened at that point. They would have launched their missiles against us. We would have launched our missiles that were in Turkey against them. Luckily, though, cooler heads prevailed, uh, and uh, the Soviet Union agreed to remove these nuclear weapons from the island of Cuba. In exchange, uh, JFK made a secret deal, this wasn't made public till years later, to remove uh, certain missiles out of Turkey that were too close for comfort for the Soviet Union. But like I said, this is the closest we ever came. And in 1991, it's not until 1991 that we found out after the Soviet Union fell that they actually did have nuclear weapons capable of reaching the United States at that time. And if we fired on them, it would have automatically meant that they fired on us. And so as a way to start cooling down some of these tensions, because we can't continue to live on the edge of a knife like this, uh, JFK and uh, the USSR try to start easing some of these Cold War tensions. It's not going to fully work, but they try to ease some of these Cold War tensions by passing the Limited Test Ban Treaty. Uh, this was to stop nuclear testing in the atmosphere. And then they also established what's known as the hotline, a direct line of communication between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So we don't have to go through all these back channels and uh, spy networks in order to get a message from one person to the next. Here you see with the location of that Bay of Pigs debacle. Uh, this is uh, intelligence from one of those U-2 spy planes showing where the uh, positions had been, where these those um, nuclear weapons had been, uh, been, they were going to build them. Now, busy, busy decade, obviously. Uh, JFK also has to deal with civil rights. So as if the Cold War isn't enough to continue dealing with, civil rights is also an issue as well. Now, in the beginning, at least, JFK was somewhat soft on civil rights. Remember, he needs the Solid South to get stuff passed. And Southern de Democrats are obviously uh, not too open to civil rights legislation. But his hand is going to be forced to some degree. Uh, the Supreme Court had ruled that segregated busing was unconstitutional. But just like we see with education, we have to test it in order to see if uh, the southern states will actually abide by it. Um, so in 1961, 13 people trying to test this boarded uh, interstate busing like greyhounds to ride through the south and breaking uh, the Jim Crow laws along the way to see what would happen, to try to draw national attention to this issue and to force Kennedy to act. Um, when they reached uh, Anniston, Alabama, they were beaten at the state line and a bomb was thrown on board. Luckily, nobody was killed. The Freedom Riders, as they, are con as they are called now, continued on even after this be these beatings and even after the bomb was thrown on, continuing on to Birmingham, Alabama, where they were pulled off the bus, beaten um, uh, with um, sticks and metal clubs and whatnot. And once again, the uh, white police uh, stood by and did nothing. The um, attorney general at this time was Robert Kennedy. This is JFK's brother. He was horrified to see that the police had done nothing to protect the Freedom Riders. And so he intervened on the federal government's behalf, sending down uh, U.S. Marshals to protect the Freedom Riders as they continued on their journey into the Deep South so that they could continue and finish the Freedom Ride. In September of 1962, uh, an African-American veteran by the name of James Meredith won a court case that allowed him to enroll in the all-white University of Mississippi, also known as Ole Miss. Uh, this was a 
uh, uh, publicly funded college, there was no reason that they had to uh, bar him from admittance. Um, however, the governor of um, Mississippi at this time, Ross Barnett, was trying to use this as a campaign issue to stop James Meredith from entering the University of Mississippi. And so Ross Barnett sent in uh, the National Guard to bar his entry. JFK once again has no choice, uh, and he orders his brother Robert Kennedy to send in U.S. Marshals to escort James Meredith to the registrar's office to force their hand to allow him to register for classes. This act alone prompted a huge riot on the campus of Ole Miss. In the end, um, it took U.S. troops being sent in to put down this riot. 200 were arrested, and it took 15 hours to bring this riot to an end, all because a black man wanted to register for classes at the University of Mississippi. Here you see at the top James Meredith being escorted by U.S. Marshals, um, and over here is the bomb that was thrown on board the Freedom Riders bus. So the Civil Rights Movement, we've talked about this already, um, mostly this is being promoted through a nonviolent technique. The idea behind nonviolent technique is the African Americans are doing um, what they're supposed to be doing. They're not fighting back. And so this is going to play out on television and in the newspapers every single day. So as to alarm your regular northern white people or even regular white southern people to the atrocities that are going on because the all white mob is not going to respond so nicely. So the SCLC, who we've already talked about, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, conference. Uh, this was Dr. King's organization. He is the one focusing on these, this civil disobedience in order to promote desegregation. So after their victory in um, at the Montgomery bus boycott, they move on to Birmingham. Birmingham was considered to be the most segregated, most racially violent city in all of the United States. So, bringing this nonviolent technique, they marched on Birmingham. Dr. King was uh, promptly arrested. He was arrested many times during his t uh, tenure in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and from his jail cell in April of 1963, he wrote his very famous letter from a Birmingham jail, basically saying that we can't wait any longer for civil rights to come. Um, while he was in a Birmingham jail, um, the civil rights movement continued in the city of Birmingham. Um, and the most broadcast issue was the Children's Crusade, uh, using teenagers in this march. And this is going to play out on television because uh, the people of Birmingham respond by sending attack police dogs on these children, these teenagers, uh, spraying them with fire hoses and beating them with billy clubs. This media attention that is drawn to this horrifies the United States because of how brutal it is. It's one thing to say, oh, I support segregation when I don't know what it looks like, but this is what segregation looks like and people are starting to change their mind. Because of the issue in Birmingham, JFK has no choice. He can't turn a blind eye anymore. And so he proposed that a civil rights bill be passed to try to bring about an official end to segregation. In order to um, push this issue through Congress, a march on Washington was called together. All of the major organizations were to bring people to Washington. The SCLC, the NAACP, the SNCC organization, CORE, all of them brought marchers to Washington. Approximately 250,000 people marched on Washington in August of 1963 in order to support a new Civil Rights Act. And this is where Dr. King once again very famously delivered his I Have a Dream speech, promoting the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, Unluckily for JFK, he never lived to see this pass, but it was actually signed into law by his successor, Lyndon Johnson, in 1964, and we'll talk about that later. Um, another area that has to be focused on when it comes to civil rights is voter registration. If you remember back, the 15th Am Amendment had guaranteed African American men the right to vote. But on a large scale in the South, this was not occurring for all of those reasons that we've already talked about. Intimidation, um, poll taxes, um, literacy tests, whatever it is to keep African Americans from voting. So in the summer of 1964, CORE and SNCC are focusing on voter registration drives throughout the South to try to bring um, African Americans to the polling places. Here you see the March on Washington.
So let's talk a little bit about LBJ. Um, Lyndon Johnson uh, is a new dealer, and he had actually come to Congress on uh, FDR's coattails back in the day. Uh, he had actually tried to run for the nomination for the Democratic Party in 1960, but had not succeeded against John Kennedy. However, he was put on the ticket to balance it because he was considered more experienced, and he's from the South. He's from Texas. Uh, and like I said, during his time in office, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was actually passed. This is a crazy important piece of legislation. Um, this uh, uh, law says that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, religion, national origin, or gender. And more importantly, it gave the federal government the power to enforce this. This is going to be a law with some teeth in it. Um, LBJ also is focusing on a war against poverty. He wants to try to bring the lower classes up, similar to what his hero FDR had done with the New Deal. Uh, first Pat having Congress pass the Economic Opportunity Act in 1964 to give $1 billion to youth services, anti-poverty measures, small business loans, job training, uh, etc. All of this is based on that book, um, The Other America. David, or I'm sorry, Michael Harrington in 1962 had written this book saying that there are 50 million people living in poverty in the United States. Even among the prosperity that was going on, this is The Other America. LBJ was heavily influenced by this and ha was prompted then to stage a war against poverty. Uh, this war against poverty and all of these social uh, programs that LBJ tries to get passed is known as the Great Society. This is his domestic agenda, a new era of liberalism to use the federal government to change the shape of America.